Yeah, so Werner, this is, uh, he, uh, Werner, this is my friend, Sean, who I've known for 10 years. And he helped me move into Ivy House. And he's my very dear friend. And we just love talking about this. And, and we, like I said, we'll have done the, the, uh, inter the um, introduction to you prior uh, to the recording. So, and Sean, this is Werner, who you, I've been talking about for many years. Nice to meet you, Sean. Nice to meet you, man. I feel like I know uh, quite a bit about you um, just I over see. the years. I, 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 <laughs> it's all good things, actually. I, I enjoy the uh, I, I, she reads me the text that you send her sometimes, and I really enjoy that you tease her often um, because I also tease her often. I see. <laughs> all right. So um, the question that we start off usually on our podcast asking everyone and then of course we go off on whatever we want to talk about is um do you remember a point when you were young where the world didn't make sense like something the things you'd been taught you know you felt uncomfortable in your skin or something wasn't quite right in in the belief systems actually as long as i can remember back I felt something is strange there. As a kid, I felt I'm not belonging here. Somehow it's a mistake. What the hell am I doing here in this <laughs> world? <laughs> it went in the childish mind then so far that I suspected my parents. Actually, they may not be my parents. They brought me from somewhere and they don't tell me the truth what's going on. So. As long as I can remember, I felt something is strange. Then I was looking for answers, looking what, where I could find. And of course, bring, being brought up there with uh, Christian surroundings and going to all the usual Christian training, Sunday school and stuff. Then with about 12, I become a very ardent Christian. <laughs> <coughs> The person of our church came home to my parents and said, Werner, you should become, uh, Werner should become a priest, should become a person. He has all the makeup for that. <laughs> but then I started to question more and then he didn't like me anymore so much. <laughs> <laughs> and then with 14, I came across yoga. There was a very good yoga school in Switzerland, you know, at that time uh, there weren't yoga schools everywhere. There wasn't spiritual liter literature everywhere. But then this yoga school really opened up new possibility and for the first time I had really the feeling, wow, this whole damn story could make sense. <laughs> there is a possibility to to do something with yourself and your life. This was a Hungarian woman, maybe you have heard the name Elizabeth Heitsch. She wrote at that time a book which became at that time something of a spiritual bestseller called Initiation. And her partner was an Indian man from Chennai, Selvarajan Yesudyan, and they were were just giving me from the beginning a very good direction. They were always quoting Ramana Maharshi and Sri Ramakrishna. And so from there, that really took off. <laughs> Do you remember when you first decided to, that you'd like to go to India? As soon as I started to read about yoga, then I had all these fantasies, oh, I will go to the Himalayas, find a yogi in a cave and <laughs> become a yogi in the Himalayas. <laughs> how, how old were you? Did you, say you were, uh, were you 14? You said you were 14 when you found yoga? Yes, right. And it's pretty much right away in yoga or when you, when you heard about India. So 14, 15, 16, you wanted to travel to India and you kind of had the, the fantasy in the, I don't want to say fantasy is in a derogatory way, but in your mind, you, you, you thought to move to India and have that kind of spiritual experience of... Yes, it, uh, it was there. Then, mm -hmm. of course, I was a young, healthy man <laughs> and having all my usual urges. 
<laughs> so <coughs> I was <laughs> was involved uh, there in living my life, but there was always that idea. Eventually, I'll go to India, and actually, I went then for years through quite a struggle. Had periods that I thought, no, I don't want to have anything to do with this world. Uh, spending all my time, my spare time, doing yoga, reading. I grabbed any book that I could find. <laughs> and then thinking, no, no, I'm finished with all that. But then uh, all my desires would just build up, build up, build up. And then it would come out, burst out, and they would make up for all the things that I didn't do for some time. <laughs> but yes, it was set from from early somehow it seems like i didn't have a choice hmm. i was looking and seeking my whole life for something that makes sense and when i came across yoga and through yoga about deeper spirituality somehow it was deep down it was clear if there is anything that makes sense for me in my life then i have to go for that <laughs> And do you remember what brought you to India? Like what, uh, when you got the ticket and when you decided was somebody said something or what, what, why was the time right when you finally went and when was that? Actually, I decided to go quite early and uh, always was waiting for that. I didn't, I didn't like school. Although people said, oh, you should go to college, should go to university, I didn't feel like, so I became a farmer. <laughs> and made the, did the training as a farmer and the agricultural school. And after that, when I was finished with 20, I thought soon, soon I'm going to India. So I started to take up only jobs, of which I thought I'm just doing that for some time, earning some money, and then I go to India. And I was talking about it, all my friends started already laughing about me, always you talk about going to India, you never go. And it took till 25, until I finally left. Mm. But during that time, uh, for a few years, I had already contact with Swami Chinmayananda. He's a Vedanta, he was a Vedanta teacher who has created a school, ashram school in Bombay, where you can go and study Vedanta. So he used to come to Switzerland for 10 days, has his talks about the Bhagavad Gita and the Upanishads. I would attend those and ask him, can I come? But he had these kind of courses that the uh, once you are in, then you should stay or you can go, but you cannot easily join in the middle. So he, he said, wait, 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 wait. Whenever he came, I said, can I come now? No, wait, wait. <laughs> and somehow that was very good because in that period, I had to experience on this level, in this world, quite a lot of things which was good that I had gone through. But then when I left finally with 25, I felt now I'm really going for that. That was 1980 and I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Did you, did you feel like, I know when I landed the first time in India, I felt like home to me. I felt like I'd come home and I knew I wanted to come back a lot. Is that how you felt when you first landed? Because some people don't, some people want to run as soon as they arrive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I landed in Delhi in the middle of the night, two o'clock in the morning. It was 30 centigrades <laughs> in the night. I came out and that heat assaulted me <laughs> and I came out and thought wow <laughs> finally I'm here never was that feeling I want to run away
after that, I went down to Bombay to that school, and it felt wonderful. In Switzerland, I felt always lonely, although it was easy to make friends. I had a lot of friends, friends, uh, as you call them, friends. I could easily hang out with people, but at the same time, I felt strange and lonely. And then I came to that school, we were 80 students there, and I felt, ah, finally, I'm coming home with equal-minded people. <laughs> but it took, didn't take that long that the same feeling came back again. But even there, I felt lonely. And it became clear it has nothing really to do with the people. It has nothing really to do with the surroundings. That's something that I'm creating in myself. Anyhow, I was very happy. It was really giving me a good start for India, being a bit in a sheltered space and sometimes going out to, we used to go to some talks, sometimes to Bombay in the midst, <laughs> in the midst of uh, that chaos that is amazing when you come from the West. <laughs> but then it also, I understood, okay, I like the school and it's very sincere and serious, but still it's not really my cup of tea. But, uh, reading books, studying books, reading more, studying Sanskrit grammar rules and go <laughs> going for that. I wanted to go deeper, practice. So I started to look around. I'm always talking. Do you, do you want to say oh, something? We're fascinated. No, we're fascinated. Sorry, it's just, you know, I, I, for a moment there, when you, when you described uh, walking off the plane and having that initial, the heat uh, that you said assaulted you, you looked off for a moment and you, you were reliving that moment in your mind. It, it, I could see it and you had, you had an, almost an emotional reaction to that memory, uh, like a very deep, uh, enriching feel. I, I, the question that I had as you were experiencing and talking about what you just had, especially when you said, you know, the loneliness um, went away as soon as you, you know, got to India and then went in the classroom. When you look at that moment in fondness, what was it about that moment? Uh, was it the achieving of getting to India and that finally, you know, after 10 years of knowing you were going to get there and finally getting there, was that what filled you with joy? Or was there something about the environment of actually being in India that, that filled you with the obvious joy that you just experienced as living in the memory? I think it was mainly a feeling that I had coming out something that is very special to India when you come okay. from outside and you even if you land in a big city like Delhi there's simply something there which is also there in the west which is there in special places in the west <laughs> that was Leo <laughs> <laughs> but uh, which has been overwritten a lot in most of the places in the West and which is in spite of the chaos, in mm. spite of the noise, in spite of all the stuff that is going on in India, it's simply there. <laughs> so even in the, all the noise of, of India, in the, the city environment of it, there is still a resonance of peace, a peaceful feeling that kind of washes over you. Yes. The, the, okay. At least that's what I felt when, when I came out of the plane. Ah, wow. And <laughs> sort of, uh, it felt very familiar. Mm. Wow, that's interesting. Familiar. That's powerful. Yes. yes. That's, the same, that's the same way I felt. It was interesting because I landed also, many of us do when we come overseas, we land at uh, between one and three and four in the morning mm -hmm. after yeah. not sleeping for 10 to 24 hours. And it's, so it's, it, you're like, it's like in a surreal dream anyway. And I also landed in Delhi the first yeah. time that I went. 
And, um, and I, yeah, it, it, it felt totally foreign, like nothing I'd ever experienced, but completely comfortable and familiar at the same time. Hmm. Like it was that, that dichotomy. And what's interesting, Werner, is that Sean has not yet been to India. No. Um, he has a wife and children. And so it's a little bit more challenging, but we, you know, we used to, Sati and I would joke for him with him for years now saying that if he ever went to India, he would never come back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, you, st- you, you got there and stayed there for 40 years. I, you know, my wife would come and find me and probably choked me out if I stayed in India right. for longer than a couple of weeks. So. <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah, so it, it's Actually, it's and it's totally fine. Yeah, go ahead. We we want you to talk. So yeah, please do. Ahead. Just uh, I can come back to my story, but just in the same context, I went back to Switzerland for a visit after twelve years for the first time. And then when I came back from that visit of the three months, I landed in Chennai. And then I just walked from the airport to the local train to go to hop on a bus and it was also in the in the night but it was still noisy lots of people it was dirty i came with my two little bags and hopped in that local train and i just liked it all Hmm. i just loved it to be back (laughs) (laughs) in spite of all this external stuff when you come from the west, when you come from Switzerland, where there it's really the total opposite. It's all so regulated, clean. <laughs> you are not allowed to make a peep, otherwise the police comes. <laughs> and then I came back into this chaos, and I just loved it all to go back. <laughs> How long, do you remember how long you had to go back for Switzerland that first time? And how long it was in between coming back to India? Uh, how long I was in Switzerland or how long until I went? Well, well, you were you left for in India that first time when you were 25. How long did you stay in India? Without going back, back 12 years. Oh, 12 years that first time. Yes. Oh, wow. Yes. Wow. Okay. And then, and then when you were in Switzerland, how long were you in Switzerland for? Three months. Three months and then okay. you went back again. Wow, I don't think I knew that 12 years the first time without leaving. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. Well, so how long did you get into that three months in Switzerland before you were ready to get back? I didn't how, quite get the question. When you were in Switzerland, when you visited Switzerland for three months after wow. that first 12 years, how long did you make it in Switzerland before you were ready to go back to India? Oh, I took the return ticket when I left. <laughs> right, so you knew you were going to go for three months, but were you ready to, to leave like the second you landed or did you, you know, how was that three months? Do you remember? Anyhow, uh, because I went back only when my experience of all this had already, already changed profoundly. Gotcha, then, okay. okay. Then it was all a game. I went back with enthusiasm, just let's go for the ride for some time, knowing anyhow, uh, for the time being, I don't have to stay there, I'll come back here. <laughs> hmm. <clears throat> yeah. So there, there wasn't a pressure when you were in Switzerland, there wasn't a pressure anymore, you had re- let go of a lot of that, any kind yes, of... Yes, right. right. Feel, okay, it was, gotcha. Actually, Very it cool. was quite fun. But <laughs> if you want, I come back a bit to my story there in yes. Bombay. Yes, yes. yes. Although I liked the school, I liked the teacher, I liked, it was not Swami Chinmayananda himself, he was always traveling around and giving talks, but one of his students was the teacher there. But then somehow I felt it's not really what I should do there and started to look around, visited other teachers when they came. I saw Nitsargadatta during that time, I saw Ananda Mai, I saw Jay Krishnamurti, and then there was a student who told me about his teacher in Kerala, about a young woman in a fisher village. Nobody knew her except local people. And everything he told me fascinated me. 
except that I thought he is always so over emotional. Something I, <laughs> we were there busy with that abstract Advaita, and he was always so emotional about her. And she used to write him letters. Oh, my son, uh, Amma is so sad that you are away from her. And that, that I thought, uh, what kind of guru is this supposed to be? <laughs> right? But still, and then at the end of 1980. I traveled with an American man through the South because for some time there were no classes. And we thought, let's go and see Chandra's Amma also in Kerala. And then we came there, there was only the house of her parents, one hut made of leaves like my roof here, with the, one hut with three rooms made of leaves and the teeny, teeny temple, like uh, four meters or four meters. <laughs> that was the whole place. And when I walked in there, and she came out of a hut, she totally, it totally overwhelmed me right away. I fell at her feet, didn't even re remove my backpack. Stayed there for a few days, and it was so amazing an experience. I felt like I'm somehow in a fairy tale or like like tales of the Greek gods that come down to earth. <laughs> she was doing there for the locals at the time three times a week Krishna Bhava and Devi Bhava. That means she was standing in the temple as Krishna for some time and then there was a break and then after that the same thing as Devi. Uh, and and there was that young, crazy mystic with just, uh, except during those power nights, we were just uh, a few people, a handful of people hanging around with her. And it was such an overwhelming experience after that, I walked out like stoned, like on a trip. Still, I went back to Bombay. I had talked to the main Swami that uh, maybe it's not my cup of tea and he had actually given me a great offer, an opportunity that when they are creating now an ashram in the Himalayas and when it's finished, I can go there. There will be a school in Hindi with a teacher there, but he also will be there. He thought he will withdraw from giving talks and that uh, with a very small group, I can stay with him. This was an offer beyond all expectations because when he came to Bombay, 10,000 people would come running after him. <laughs> but then, uh, when I was in Bombay, then this Amma from Kerala was always, always in my head. I couldn't stand it after a short time. I left and went down to Kerala. So since in between, I went uh, for another visit, went again to, uh, to Bombay, but then I couldn't stand it. And I went back since March 81, then I was there. So actually, I didn't finish that course, which I intended to do for three years in Bombay. I stayed only one year. And after that, I went down and was with Amma. And since then, actually, I have always been either there or here. <laughs> I haven't traveled much in my life. <laughs> so, um, what I know, you know, because I've known you for many years that you um, meditated in some of the caves in Tirvanamalai and, and then also they built you something in Amma's ashram. So, what was the first time that Amma told you or that you went away to be in silence? What, what, when was that? Actually, in the beginning, there was not really much space there where you could hide. But from the beginning, she said, you can sit, you want to sit, so don't do anything else. <laughs> but uh, then sitting there, meditating there meant uh, I'm sitting in the corner of a hut 
and people come in and out and walk over my knees and talk in loud voices as if I was not sitting there or then sitting under a coconut tree and somehow moving with the shade and the ants would eat me up. <laughs> and then I asked her, can I not go somewhere where I'm a bit more silent? She said, wait, wait, and kept me there for months. And then at a certain time she said, okay, you can go to Tiruvan Namalai. And actually the first four years we've had, then I spent a lot of time here. There was a house from an American devotee, Neil Rosner, who became one of the senior Swamis, now Swami, uh, uh, something Atma, Adyatmananda, no, Paramatmananda. <laughs> yeah, you see now, uh, his house was here, so I could live in that house. And then whenever Amma called me, I used to go to Kerala. And whenever she let me go, I used to come here to Tiruvannamalai and live there. And from there used to go, the first period I used to go up to Virupaksha cave. When I came to Tiruvannamalai, she said me only two things. She said, Virupaksha is a good way, uh, a good place to meditate. That was one. And the second one, Stay away from Westerners. <laughs> <laughs> that's always good advice. <laughs> <laughs> that's, what I, that's what I did. After that, when I came the second time here, I just stayed in the house. I didn't go really out much. And then, 85, I went from here there. An old French woman wanted to see Yama. So I accompanied her to Kerala and I thought I'm just going for a short visit but then Amma nailed me down for five years at the row <laughs> and by that time they had constructed that cave, we called it the cave but it was just a little cell on the ground and right away she said you can go there were two cells you can go and live in one of those and so there it started <laughs> For two and a half years I used to come out because first it was just you could go down a few steps and then go left or right in one of those two cells and that's, that was it. So I had to come out for the bathroom, <laughs> had to come out for eating and I used to do a little work in the ashram but most of the time I was sitting, leaving down, the, down there. Then I asked whether I can withdraw a bit more even <laughs> and she was she agreed so we added to one of the cells a toilet and then a gate like just wooden bars that the air could go through but the, the just closing that they could close the door and then for the first time I closed the door and stayed there for two years without coming out <laughs> wow wow what was that? What was that? What was that like? Because that, that would have been, you know, that was after years already of uh, doing not much else but uh, meditating all the time. Uh, I said, I said as much as I could day and night. So it was not that much of a change. That hmm. Not more coming out. First, Amma came when I first entered. And we looked and I gave her the key and said, now uh, take the key because if I hear, I was in the middle of the ashram that was growing and growing. If I hear you outside, I may come out. So I don't want that. And she used to sometimes come and visit and brought the key always with her. And after 10 months, I told her, now you can leave the key. I'm not coming out. <laughs> so, <laughs> wow. And why, why, di why didn't you want to come out? What was your mechanism for not wanting to come out of that silence? <clears throat> it was mainly that I felt that's, that's what I have to do. Uh, I mm. have to say, I mean, I was still struggling there. I still had this idea, I have to struggle, have to struggle, I have to reach something, a goal called enlightenment or whatever, <laughs> hoping that I have to do my work and eventually something will be served on a silver platter called enlightenment. <laughs> 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 
<coughs> but at, by the time I had done years of lots of meditation and I had a bit calm down because in the beginning I was mad. In the beginning I was mad with the idea, I want, I want, I want something. And there was a real pain in the bum for Amma because I went always after her, do something about it. <laughs> for heaven's <laughs> sake, do something. You can do it like this. Ooh, why don't you do anything? <laughs> and she somehow managed to keep that fire alive but uh, somehow to keep me going because sometimes in the beginning I was desperate thinking I try I try and nothing is happening and she somehow managed to dangle in front of my nose <laughs> that, that ID just work a little more right? just work a little more <laughs> it will be all right <laughs> but then when I was staying in the cave finally I had developed at least a little bit of patience, which I didn't have in the beginning. <laughs> so that I could accept, all right, I'm just doing whatever I have to do. And she was very supportive. She used to come once in three weeks, once in a month. And then actually she played a, a terrible game with me. She really put me up totally on a pedestal. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> she used to come and praise me and tell me that you are the number one and the others are the zeros behind uh, and stuff. And she was telling to people all kinds of stuff uh, that oh, you guys, what you are doing, look at Werner. And, and of course, I had then all not so much friendly feelings that would come to me in the game <laughs> from the surroundings when she was always doing that game. And I was scared, so thinking if a guru is doing that, that's dangerous. <laughs> be careful, be careful. But in spite of that, of course, I still felt. <laughs> <laughs> could help it. You could Couldn't help it, man. Help it. Couldn't no, help you, it. Somehow. You want to feel that that uh, that sense of uh, importance, right? You want to right. that that identity with. Oh, I am getting somewhere. She flipped the script on you. At first it was, you're not getting anywhere. And now she's, you're at the top. You're, you know, she's testing your, your ego, I suppose. Right. She was boosting it. <laughs> <And> then, <laughs> really giving me the feeling that it is very, very, very important what I'm doing here. And then suddenly after two years, she took all that support away and uh, drew me through, uh, period of total confusion. It started that she just visited once in the cave as usual and then she came, made a funny face and there was a funny feeling and she made indications as if something is totally wrong but not giving any explanations and she left me in total, oh my god, what's wrong? And then only I became aware how much I had been relying on that relationship with her. In spite of coming from the Advaitic side, and she has always encouraged, yes, yes, this is your way. Uh, whenever I had the tendency to go more on the devotional side, because the whole surrounding was very devotional, she would come and say, no, no, this is your way, the, the Advaita approach. And so I would say it's all unreal and it's all a dream, but <laughs> then I became aware how much I have totally been building up on that awareness that Amma is there, she's looking, nothing can go wrong. And then suddenly she gave me the feeling, oh, 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 everything is wrong and she's not happy. And I was sitting there in my little cave and oh, oh what's wrong, what's wrong? And then all my energies build up over the years of intense meditation start to go completely crazy up and down and left and right in the body. I had been a strict celibate for 10 years and then suddenly there, uh, there was assaulted with sexuality. That <laughs> I, would, <laughs> I would jump up in my little cave and walk to and fro like a tiger in the cage, <laughs> <laughs> trying to control all that and balancing out. And 
slowly, slowly get a little bit balance. And then after three weeks, she let me hang there for three weeks. And after three weeks, summer came. And I thought, ah, oh, we can now, now we can balance out, we can put it right, all, every, everything again. And when she left, it was worse than before. <laughs> 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 and so, gradually, I really got nuts. And I could hear what's going on around the cave. I was in the midst of the ashram, and previous I had heard Amma talking and how she was, oh, Werner, 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 and there she was telling things. Like, oh, Werner, he has disobeyed Dhamma, he has done pranayamas, and now his brain is overheated, he's getting crazy. <laughs> and I slowly, uh, but uh, steadily got crazy there. <laughs> really got on a trip and uh, started to hear people talking all the time, even when they were not talking. Uh, and they start, started to hear like people were commenting on whatever I was thinking about and then misinterpreting and uh, oh, I was there on a total crazy trip and Amma was not approachable, she was not giving any help, she was totally pushing me further. When I was in the midst of it, I was totally, I mean, undone. I thought uh, all my work now for 10 years <laughs> that I have done, it goes down the drain and uh, maybe the end of my spiritual career is that I'm ending up in the loony bin. <laughs> <laughs> had already all these fantasies, oh, they, they will pack me up into an airplane, send me to Switzerland and my father will be standing there. I told you all the time, <laughs> because he did, he did uh, always tell me, oh, you, you, if you continue like this, you are going to get crazy. <laughs> She pushed me, pushed me, but then uh, later I understood, not at that time, later I understood, she knew exactly how far she can push me, that I'm not going irreparably over the edge. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> Finally, I came out uh, of the cave. Uh, and said, oh. Actually, I heard Amma talking out, and then I said, where is Amma, where is Amma? And they said, She's in reunion, <laughs> and I said, no, I know, she's here, I heard her talking. <laughs> they called Amma, oh, when there is gone completely banana. <laughs> and she said, oh, don't worry, just put him up in a room and <laughs> watch over him that he's not doing any mischief. And so the, the next humiliation was that newcomer brahmacharis, young boys, they're taking turns 24 hours watching over me in a room. <laughs> so first, first she had boosted up, boosted up my ego, wonder you, 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 and after that she made a complete idiot <laughs> of myself. <clears throat> then I, I had gone through two very strong emotions. One was being totally pissed with her, thinking I have had so much faith that nothing can go wrong when you're watching there. And obviously you have miscalculated, everything has gone wrong and we're really pissed and angry with her. Or then switching on the other side and thinking, oh, Amma had so great expectations in me and I have destroyed it all with my ego. Oh, it's, <laughs> it's all my fault. <clears throat> but then I started to work thinking, the ashram had become very active, thinking, ah, I have only for myself done my meditation, I have to work now. And then slowly, still supervised all the time that I'm not doing <laughs> mischief. <laughs> but then it started to dawn, no, actually it's just a big game, nothing is really lost. And for the first time in my life, I was ready to accept I don't have a clue. <laughs> <laughs> Previously, I always knew everything. I had studied, I had listened, uh, I had thought, I had meditated. So I, 
I knew everything. I knew the whole hierarchy of spirituality, I knew what is true, what is real, what is unreal, what is the highest, and blah, blah, blah. And suddenly all this has crumbled down and nothing made sense anymore. And uh, for the first time I was ready, really, really, if I'm honest, I don't have a clue what's going on. <laughs> I just, and right now it's crazy, it's totally upside down, but I just had to st stop resisting and go through, go with it and go through it. And when that resistance stopped, because before I was desperately somehow trying to make sense, desperately holding on to something real. Previous, as an Advaitin student, blabbing out, oh, it's all a dream, it's unreal, it's unreal, it's not the truth. But then when the reality of it started to crumble, then instead of letting go, I desperately tried to hold on to something real and everything went through the fingers. And when I stopped that and okay, I don't know, accepting, I don't know, I just have to go through. Then it started to calm down. And I started to go back in my cave again. <laughs> and it was not that the old reality started to reform again. It was more out of the rubble of all that, a new experience started to emerge. A new experience of myself, of the whole world, what this is all about. All my old belief system, which had been in a way very helpful, pushing me on, on my way, but it, most of those concepts they simply didn't make much sense anymore, including that final goal I had, had been holding on to so desperately that enlightenment thinking that in one moment, boom, there is that explosion and that's the end of the story. <laughs> it was more than a new experience emerged, a new perspective and it became clear, okay, one chapter is closed, a new chapter starts, but from there it continues, and it will continue, and it continues that essence remains the same, but the experience of it keeps on unfolding, and there is no limit to that, there is no end to that. So even that idea that had hold had been holding on so strongly of reaching a goal of enlightenment didn't make sense anymore. Where is that enlightenment or wherever you are, it still continues. <laughs> then I felt that time that I'm standing on my own feet, stayed for a few more months, but then I left, came here again, that was 1990. I felt Amma had done her job as a guru, I have done my job as a disciple. Getting that guidance from within now how to proceed. And I came here, not more in Amma's house that was also sold, but then I didn't know whether I ever go back again. Doing again a lot of things that I strictly avoided before, before my life was black and white, pure, impure, spiritual, unspiritual, <laughs> everything was in categories. And suddenly this whole damn story was all the play of the same divinity. <laughs> 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 and whether you are totally holding on to the spiritual or the not spiritual, as long as you are holding on, you are totally holding on to your idea of a story. It's, it's not that much different. And so, uh, I was living here for two and a half years. Still, I was sitting a bit, not like before, but it was more a period of settling down, letting the new energy, the new perspective settle down, getting more solid. And during that period, 92, then I went for the first time back to Switzerland, and that was great, that was fun. <laughs> and actually the one thing that I didn't expect, finally I met friends also with my father, because we, our life had been 
difficult uh, all the time together. Even when I grew up, I was not an easy guy to deal with <laughs> because I had all these strange ideas. And he was, he was not a especially good man. He was not a bad man. He was just a normal Swiss German citizen in a village. <laughs> who was very conscious of what everybody else thinks about him. And then, so uh, my being totally out of the way was always uh, something that was nagging at him. And he was very negative. I heard that from others. I didn't contact him directly most of the time when I was in India, but he was very negative about it. And then when I came back, he expected that um, some kind of a religious fanatic now who tries to convert people. And then they was then just behaving totally normal. <laughs> and even when his old mechanism started, to which I previous always used to re respond in the same way, and we would jung, 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 and, <laughs> and explode finally, I just wouldn't respond anymore. And then he completely, somehow, he was so astonished, he completely opened up and started for the first time also to listen. And we had, for the first time, something like a friendship in our common life. That was, that was a nice experience. <laughs> but uh, it's not that I felt, oh, I want to be now in Switzerland. I felt, if I have to go back, if it feels that I have to go somewhere else than India, then it's fine. I can be anywhere, but it, it didn't feel like that. So I came back and so far it isn't, doesn't feel that I should go anywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> After two and a half years here, with that uh, visit in Switzerland in between, I felt, okay, I feel like sitting again more, not driven like before. Before I had that idea, I want to reach something and my way to reach it is to sit and sit and sit. And Dharma has very much confirmed, yes, that's your approach, that's your way, you do that, do as good as you can, more, 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 more. <laughs> and now I didn't have that idea of reaching a goal anymore, but I felt it's good to sit again more because it had become natural for me to, in that way, to intensify that experience of the present. And so I started to sit again more here and then I wrote to Amma, I'm sitting again more. Maybe I'm continuing doing it here. Maybe I'm going to now to the Himalayas, find a nice place in the Himalayas, or if she's interested, I can also come back and sit there again. And then she was interested. And so I went back to the ashram in nine, the beginning of 93. She didn't try to pull me again externally in a close story. I didn't try to hang on her skirt anymore like before, <laughs> but she seemed to be happy and I went back to my cave. <laughs> For three months I came out and then I felt, oh, it's time to close the door again. Not like before, I, that I have to be more intense in order to achieve something, but it just felt the right thing to do. I didn't know for how long I'm going to stay there. It just felt right. So I went there, not knowing how long I'm going to stay, but then somehow seven years passed until I came out oh. again. <laughs> you were in a cave for seven years? Yes. Seven. Seven. Oh yes. my God. <clears throat> I wasn't in silence. People could come down and talk through the doors and look through the gate like uh, watching a monkey in the cage. <laughs> 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 but I would keep people away. Uh, 
the ashram had grown very much by that time. There were crowds there by that time. And people didn't know that they can come, but the ash people who lived in the ashram knew. So I started to talk to people who had a bit doubts or difficulties staying there, but they kept, somebody brought me food at lunch. And then after that, I kept a bit time that I would talk usually to one people, uh, one person or two, because there was a little space. You came down the stairs and there was a little space in front of my gate. So somebody could sit there or two people could sit there. But uh, most of the time I was there keeping quiet in my little space. It was a bit more than two square meters. <laughs> oh my, wow. <laughs> People thought I'm doing a terrible thing to myself, but I spent seven very happy and very peaceful years <laughs> down there. <laughs> <laughs> then, 1998, uh, two people from Switzerland came, two French, Swiss, they always had problems, a couple, they always had problems and they, they, they had somehow made me into the connecting link with the ashram. They had already come the first time in 86. And uh, whenever they came to the ashram, they would come and visit me. And then 98, they came, but they brought their daughter who had problems in Switzerland and she had not been living at home, but then she came home and said, this is my situation. I had problems and they, they somehow tried to be together, the three of them, and it was total hell. Uh, it, uh, they couldn't handle it at all. And the parents told her, oh, come, come to India with us for a visit, see Amma, and then we'll bring you to Werner. He will understand you. He will talk to you. <laughs> so they dumped her daughter in front of my cave door <laughs> and there was uh, quite from the beginning a good connection. She used to come and we were to talk about her story uh, and then she started to get interested. She had had a few yoga lessons in Switzerland before coming and then I started to teach her a few exercises and she started to do more practice and then a Tai Chi teacher came along and she started to do Tai Chi and uh, take yoga lessons in the ashram also. And soon she was practicing quite a lot. And she used to, I let her come more often than others. When others wanted to come regularly, I said, no, 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 you come after two weeks again. <laughs> but she let her come some every four days or so. And we had a good talk together and it became clear, clear sooner or later. I'll come out and we may go our way together. But then still our relationship continued for two years through the gate. I stayed for another two years in the cave until I finally came out in the year of 2000. And then there was Suda waiting there and we, we left together and came to Tiruvannamalai. And we are still here 20 years later. Wow. What, what brought you out of the cave then finally? What, what was it? It, that it, just felt, the same it felt it's time. It was not something particular. I mean, everything contributed. The, the fact that Suda was waiting there and that we want to start a life together was also an aspect. But it was not only that. It was just somehow it felt now it's time to do something else. It felt rounded up and it was clear it was not good to stay in the ashram together because it was upsetting quite uh, many people that the ascetic, the one who is really doing the thing, <laughs> comes now out and is in a relationship. <laughs> that, yeah, that yeah they, people can't handle that story, right? They can't handle the story of the guy sitting in the cave and then he has a relationship with somebody because you're not supposed to, right? You're not supposed to right. have that kind of life. That has been difficult for many people to accept. So it was better that we go out of the picture. Now, 
as we are still together 20 years later, they start to accept, okay, it seems to be okay. <laughs> but at that time, uh, we, for the second time, I was upsetting many people in the ashram. <laughs> Okay. Man, so, that's an amazing story. There wow. we are, still here in Tiruvannamalai. Then, previous I kept people away from me, and then I, I didn't do that. First, we were living out in the country for three months, but then after that, uh, we went at the uh, well, it is quite a city there already. So we went to the city in a guest house. And other people used to come, friends used to come and also live there. Then we used to meet in the afternoon, have tea together. And then they were bringing other people. And then more people came and then there were no more teacups, no enough teacups. So we dropped the tea and people would start uh, to talk about Werner Satsang. <laughs> so for then we started to do it regularly. And since then somehow the Satsang emerged. <laughs> I love that slow transition to the Satsang. I never decided I want to be a Satsang teacher. But I stopped pushing people away, uh, keeping people away, and then people came, and that was fine. Still, I'm keeping my boundaries that uh, I can do my own life. But I'm open to talk to people at times. <laughs> and somehow it continues, and now it continues. <laughs> I remember uh, it's not so long ago. One woman talked about Facebook, and I said, No, no, I'm not on Facebook. <laughs> and she said, no, no, you shouldn't be. <laughs> and now I'm on Instagram and I'm on Facebook <laughs> and have my own YouTube channel and do online satsangs. <laughs> Actually, I didn't plan this either. We did the last satsang here uh, now over the years. First I did three and then I reduced to two. I felt that's... That feels right for me that I'm doing two times in the winter season, two times a week, I'm doing satsangs. And people come, we sit together, meditate a bit, and then everybody goes their own way again. And the last satsang we did here on the roof, at five o'clock we stopped, and at six o'clock the lockdown was there. So people had to hurry, that, hurry home because of the lockdown. And somebody mentioned, we, but there is Zoom you could do, Satsang on Zoom. I never had even, had even heard the word of it. <laughs> and then, well, others made contact and said, to explain what the whole thing is, and said, where were you called? And then I tried with a tablet. <laughs> it was technically a lot of, <laughs> a lot of stuff was not quite right, but then it seemed people liked it, and so I started to do it once a week. Corinne helped me to set it up. <laughs> now I have a computer, first computer ah, in my nice. life at all. <laughs> 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 so I'm getting the digital now. <laughs> <laughs> but I just love how organic and natural it's been. And that's one of the things I've tried to sort of shed things over the last 10 years so that it my life can become more like how it is when I'm in India when I'm in India everything just flows it goes it's and then try and then coming back here and just you know trying is the wrong word because if you try it's not it but just allowing everything to be you know organic like that like I love so thank you so much for sharing <laughs> your story from the beginning, from that very beginning of when you were young to all the way up till you are now. Because I think people come to your satsangs and they hear bits and pieces of it, unless they sit for many years like I have, and we know the whole story, piecing it all together. But it's always such a gift to be able to hear your story, even though there's many other aspects still. Um, and of course, there's all the wisdom that he imparts to everybody when they ask the questions. I, but to hear your story from, from start to now is just a, it's a gift. So thank you for sharing that. It's been my pleasure. <laughs>
So next okay. time you come back, we'll, 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 Sean will have to ask you his, his deep spiritual questions, which I know he has many. <laughs> yeah, or you yeah. could also you could always wake up at four in the morning and attend Z Z the India satsang. <laughs> yeah, that that was the that was the best I could do to not ask questions and interrupt you the whole time because, I mean, the whole thing was uh, Corinne said it, but I was thinking that it, it that was a gift for for you to share that with us. Um, you know what I really enjoyed, I think the most is, you know, the what we're doing the podcast is turning points and it sounds like your biggest turning points were when it just felt like the right thing to do. It was just maybe not even the right thing, but it was just the thing to do to go into the cave and meditate. And then it was just the thing to do to come out of that. And that was a, that was your mechanism. It seemed like in your story was if it was just the thing to do at this time and space. I mean, if you want to see a turning point in my life, when I grew up and come to India and all that, it was not really one point, really uh, right. one strong point. It kept on right. turning all the time. Right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, the, the one turning point, uh, and it was not one point, but the period of a few months was after... I went through a period of real craziness and then emerged from that and from there that was really a totally different mm. experience. You, I can say I was living before for 35 years in one world and since then now I have been living for 30 years in another world and a world where there is basically yeah. yes. pe peace, not that struggle to get somewhere. Yeah. A world where yes. there is no more suffering because that doesn't mean everything is pleasant the world is still a moment pleasant a moment unpleasant <laughs> a moment it's nice a moment it's un not nice but the mind is not more creating suffering out of it a previous right. i used to wrench myself with my first with all kinds of things and then at the end really crazy i want i want i want enlightenment <laughs> <laughs> uh, and all that painful hurting myself unnecessarily that is gone for good and I'm not intending to ever start it again <laughs> <laughs> man wow powerful man thank you thank, thank you, you so much that. Werner. so good to see you 